Welcome to CivilNet. My guest is Dr. Hagop Gulujan from UCLA. Dr. Gulujan, thank you for joining us. Mm, thank you. Um, you are here in Armenia participating in a number of conferences, the Society for the, uh, Armenian Studies. Yeah, the Society for Armenian Studies, uh, Association Internationale des Études Armenien. One is the European, the other one is kind of the American. <laughs> uh, you are a lecturer, you are a professor of the Armenian language and literature at the Department of Near Eastern Language and Culture at UCLA. Um, and you've written a number of very interesting articles. When I first saw it, I thought, hmm, genocide in virtual space and exposure of the Armenian genocide in cyberspace. And you, and you look at or you examine uh, issues of identity, yeah. Armenian identity in the diaspora. Yes. And uh, you had written a, presented a paper f uh, at the conference. Uh, when I read the title, I must admit I didn't understand what it meant. Uh, but I did pick up on two words that were really interesting to me and something that um, interests me about conservatism uh, in the diaspora or the ideology of Hayabah Banum. Yeah. Um, the English translation would be of maintaining Armenian uh, culture, identity. Uh, that has really s led sometimes to the stagnation, perhaps, of Armenian communities, contributed to the ghettoization, perhaps, um, contributed to the patriarchy, perhaps. Yeah, you're reading my paper, basically. Oh, yeah. I haven't read the paper. <laughs> I promise, I should have, but I haven't read the paper. Uh, which, you know, forced Armenian women in the diaspora to be the bearers of Armenian culture and sort of push them away from leadership positions in the diaspora. So these are, I mean, these are many issues, of course. And, and the one thing that we oftentimes in Armenia talk about is how does the Armenian, who is the Armenian? How does the Armenian identify himself or herself? And what should that identity be? Talk to me, if you will, about, uh, you know, I, I gave you sort yeah. of a whole uh, well, table this is full not, of. <laughs> <laughs> this is not basically my uh, paper, but uh, about who is an Armenian. That's a question I see a lot. I have read a lot of, not a lot, but a couple of science uh, articles about who is an Armenian and they they get close to fascism or <laughs> something similar to that. Uh, so uh, to me there there are two or three ways to uh, Armenians consider themselves uh, Armenians. What is the Armenian nation? One would be, okay, we have uh, I see that in my classes, Armenian heritage students would say, I'm pure Armenian. What is pure Armenian? Let me examine your blood or something. Mm -hmm. no? uh, we know Armenians have had uh, this uh, um, permanent, invariable uh, racial composition for a number of centuries, but they are diverse in their origins, at least five or six ethnic groups, so that's <laughs> a little shaky. And then, uh, should we consider Armenians, uh, this is my example I give always, the Nakfurs, the Greek Orthodox in South Lebanon, they the descendants of Nikephor Phokas, the emperor, Byzantine emperor, who had, by the way, Armenian ancestors. So those Arab-speaking Greek Orthodox, they are Armenian or I don't know, Northern Lebanon inhabitants, Zgharta, Maronites, they are, they are, they have Armenian origins, they have even Armenian Bibles, but, so this is one. <laughs> no, I mean, we could certainly say that the, any person yeah. who says that I'm Armenian is Armenian. Yeah, that's who the that's Armenian is. That's another way. Sure, I mean, it. a very simplistic, very sort of black and white thing, but in terms of identity, uh, what I was trying to get to is that oftentimes, uh, you know, the, the grand narrative of the Armenian people in the last century was the Armenian genocide. It was a defining moment, and we identify ourselves through the genocide. Yeah. Is that a continuing phenomenon today in the diaspora? It is a continuing phenomenon. It will be, and probably it has to be. You can't detach yourself from something so huge and so unresolved. On the, uh, we are, uh, people say, oh, we have to get rid of this victim psychology, but we are victims. I feel myself a victim. What we have to 
be careful about. Uh, that's why I, why I stress usually is um, we're getting rid of our personal experience as victims. Mm -hmm. Our grandfather, grandmother, uh, what have you lost in Kesaria, Tikranakert, Harpert? The newest generation, they don't know about it. They, they'll scream genocide, genocide, genocide. And I ask them, what have you lost? They don't know. So they're politicized people. So that's, this has become a political issue, not a personal issue. I don't say that it, it, it doesn't have to be political. But when, you, when you're losing your personal experience, uh, it becomes, you know, uh, encyclopedia entry, basically. Um, I try to stay attached to the roots. Uh, and uh, okay, um, what, these papers about cyberspace. Talk, talk to me about that. What, what are you trying to say? No, that was a survey. I'm not sure. I want to say much there. Uh, it was a survey about how much. Uh, our, uh, the internet was speaking about the Armenian genocide, and there were interesting, uh, you know, waves mm -hmm. close to uh, to April twenty fourth, or uh, co in comparison with uh, uh, Holocaust, mm -hmm. uh, Greek uh, uh, catastrophe, the Rwanda genocide, etc. There were a number of uh, lessons you could take out from there, but. Um, uh, what I would maybe <laughs> think more about now is uh, what do we do with the internet as, uh, you know, in, yeah. Is it, does it become part of our toolbox as Armenians to... It has to. So uh, when I was talking about uh, identity and people uh, saying I'm Armenian because I have Armenian blood or I'm Armenian because I've, uh, I live in a nation state called Armenia, which both are, to me, <laughs> bad things to say and think about. Uh, there's a third uh, option, which is uh, Mesrop Mashtot's option. In the fifth century, the creator of, of the Armenian alphabet, uh, he wasn't alone. It was a church plus the state. It was a huge project financed by a state, a king, who knew the kingdom was falling. It was going to disappear. So what were they thinking? Why were they... <laughs> Why did they embark on such a you know, huge project? Because they understood nationhood as a cultural thing. So uh, you have a, a blood nation, a nation state, and a cultural nation. I understand nationhood, ethnicity as uh, shared culture, mm -hmm. language, basically, but obviously other things too. And uh, uh, the, our, our contemporary world, 21st century, is totally virtualized. Mm -hmm. Not totally, but almost. Sure. So it has been uh, 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 virtualizing since 1950s or 20s even, you know, transport techno transportation technology, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I, I think it leads us to uh, a future where I foresee uh, crisscrossing matrix of different diasporas. The world will be a, a matrix of diasporas. So how would these people uh, have their own culture, language, or whatever culture is composed of transmit to their uh, next generation or even to horizontally? Because you own a culture because you like it, not because you have to. That's the difference between the 19th and 20th century and the 21st, which is basically choice. Virtualization, internet is choice. Facebook, your friends are choice. Mm -hmm. uh, the newspapers you read are choice. You had to read the paper. You could buy, you know, a uh, street before. Now you read, I know, Shanghai Times. Sure, so, which you would never have read back in the day. That's it. So it, identity too. The place you live is choice. I talked to uh, 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 a girl from Shushi, a very nice girl. She wanted to go to Moscow. Uh, she was choosing, even when he, she had a nice job. Yerevan is a nice city. She wanted to go to Moscow. She's choosing. So. People will choose, that's why. We'll okay, uh, so I, I'm going to ask the question. 
which in my mind comes logically after what you have just said. I, I, if we consider all of that, then in the loss, in, in, the, in the loss of language and culture, how does one identify as an Armenian or a Greek or, or, or a Jewish pers person or a Turk? I mean, if, if the Armenian, if, if what connects us to nationhood is the culture, if it's yeah. the language and the culture, uh, you know, you've lived in South America, you live in North America now, you witness that on a daily basis, the loss of the language. If you don't know the language and the fact that we're having this conversation in English, perhaps yeah. is an indicator of that. Um, if you can't read the literature, if you can't read the poetry, if you can't read or understand the music, the lyrics to the music. There's not much more. Uh to hold on as a, uh, what is nationhood to me? Uh, my definition of uh, belonging to a nation or an ethnicity is that I enjoy something, language, let's say, that I have taken from my parents or higher up. I love using it and enjoying it. And I really would like to transmit it to my next generation because I want to share something beautiful. Uh, this is a new definition. A uh, hundred years ago, twenty years ago, it was different. It was, I have to stay Armenian or Chinese or whatever because that's what uh, you sure, know. Sure, that, God that and was the nature. paradigm, yeah. and so so internet and this globalized world has come and shifted all of that around. Yeah. And so now, do we need to look for those definitions, or will they just sort of holistically, organically? become defined somehow? Well, I usually ask people to look for those definitions, people, institutions, diaspora institutions, because if we insist on you must, we must, it won't lead anywhere. The must uh, creates a fence around us. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're happy inside the fence, but once you grow up, you're looking out of the fence, you know, at college level, uh, most of most people will jump the fence and want to come back because there's a fence to this side too. Well, that was about my paper uh, last week. Uh, Sarafian's idea, uh, a huge poet of diaspora in the 30s, when there was no transnationalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, he was talking about the liminal space, a space in between, an in betweenness identity. So he tried to integrate to the French society as an intellectual. He did, and he celebrated it, but then he, he felt kind of bad. Mm -hmm. He looked back and said, I can't forget this, oh blood. That was his, his, his phrase. So, and he came back, but felt bad again. So he uh, so identified- So somewhere in between the two worlds. He identified the contradiction between those two drives. Uh, that contradiction was our tragedy, he said, as diaspora. But then, in a third book, he develops further that contradiction. And he says, why it should be our uh, tragedy? It's a tragedy if I go back and forth. Uh, what if I say, welcome to contradiction? And I celebrate the space contradiction. In mm -hmm. And, I, and for, for him, diaspora is a floating on the waters. Uh, low tide and high tide, and it's a chaos, kind of chaos is productive, fruitful, no rules. Uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful... Uh, <laughs> it really is a, a, a very interesting and beautiful sentiment. Uh, Dr. Gulujan, thank you so much. Uh, we can certainly talk for hours on this topic, Obviously. but uh, uh, thank you for taking the time from your schedule to come and talk to us about these questions of Armenian identity and the space in between <laughs> that we occupy, whether that's in the nation state or whether that's in the diaspora, I presume. A pleasure. Thank you for, him, for the invitation. I'd like to remind our viewers that my guest was Dr. Hagop Kulujan from UCLA. Stay with Civil Network.